Hello everyone. Welcome to your own channel, Theoretical Carnest Matter Physics. And this is our lecture number 5 in B Smart India pre lecture series. So, the aim of this lecture series is the same as of the previous ones. And of course, uh, following the tradition, we will try to stick to concepts and some very few easy mathematics. We will not go into mathematical details here. This lecture is going to be a little longer than the others. So, please sweet, calm and concentrated. Have peace and don't lose the flow and complete the video uninterrupted. It will be better if you sheet with a pen and paper and, and write down anything you need to know, your, the question you have and post uh, whatever question you have in the comment section. Okay, so let's go into the lecture. Now, a key concept in DFT calculation is the idea of convergence. Now, whenever you are going to present your DFT research in uh, in your PhD Viva or maybe in somewhere else, maybe the most common question that will be asked by the theoreticians will be, can you comment on how well converged your results are? So, to make your research good enough, it's clear that you too should ask yourself the very same question repeatedly many times while doing the calculations. Now, let's try to understand the term convergence in DFT. See, the ground state electron density of a configuration of atoms as approached by DFT is defined by the solution to a complicated set of mathematical equations. You know that. We have discussed this in lectures 1 to 4. Now, to actually solve this problem on a computer, we have to make a series of numerical approximations. And in each numerical approximation, it is possible to find a solution which is closer and closer to the exact solution by using more and more computational resources. A well converged calculation is the one in which the numerically derived solution actually approximates the true solution of the mathematical problems as posed by DFT with a specific exchange correlation functional. Of course, uh, if you are using DFT, you have a specific exchange correlation functional. This means that we will call your results well converged only if it accurately approximates the true solutions as posed by DFT. But be aware, what we have talked is uh, your results are well converged when they accurately approximates the problems as posed by DFT. But the concept of numerical convergence is quite separate from the question of whether DFT actually describes the physical reality or not. As we do not know the exact precise form of the XG functional, the mathematical problem defined by DFT is not identical to the full Schrodinger equation. This means that the exact solution of a DFT problem is not identical to the exact solution of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, you got that, right? So, we will discuss more about the physical accuracy of DFT maybe after finishing this lecture series. But for now, let's concentrate on a more complicated issue, the convergence, which means, once one more time I am showing you because this should be clear. Convergence means that your solution approximates the accurate solutions of the equations as posed by DFT only, not by Schrodinger equation. So, in your viva or wherever you are presenting your uh, calculation, you may be asked that question. So, you should be clear about that at first. Okay. Now, as you may have noticed already, I have not provided any content for this video because I really couldn't separate things to be talked here. Uh, however, just know that in this video, we are going to focus on what actually is required to perform a well converged DFT calculation or in other words, we are just going to give a boost to your confidence level. Okay. Our first step into the realm of numerical convergence takes us far away from the comfortable 3D space in which we are living. And we move into what is known as reciprocal space. Yeah, of course, I know that at this level, I don't have to talk much about the reciprocal space. You definitely are smart in this topic. You all are definitely smart in this topic. But... There is no harm in taking just a brief recap, maybe the briefest recap I am going to give you. See, the lattice defined in reciprocal space or K space is called the reciprocal lattice. And the Wigner seed cell of the reciprocal lattice is called the first Prilova zone and so on. 
surely you know about the weakness sheet cell. Let's say you have a lattice point marked as P. We will connect only nearest neighbors from P. Now by drawing perpendicular bisectors on each of these lines, we get the weakness sheet cell. Okay, look, the Coulomb potential inside a crystal is periodic. As a consequence in Schrodinger equation, the potential energy function should be of the form V of R equals to V of R plus Rn, where Rn is actually just the translational vector. So Rn equal to N1 A1 vector plus N2 A2 vector plus N3 A3 vector, provided N1 N2 and N3 are integers and A1 A2 A3 are just unit lattice vectors. However, what Bloch theorem says in this context is, as the potential is such periodic, the wave function psi k of r in a crystal can be expressed as the product of a plane wave and a function u k of r, which has the same periodicity as that of the lattice, where u k of r is equals to u k of r plus r n. Okay, so r n is just that translational vector we have talked about. These u k functions are called the block functions. Now, this wave vector k has a specific relation with momentum, p equals to h cross k. Just as the position vector r has three components, x, y, and z in real 3D space, k also has three components, kx, ky, and kz, and the space defined by them is called momentum space or reciprocal space. Well, try to understand. If you want to measure the distance from London to New York and if you are using momentum space to measure that distance, this is quite a bad idea because the real 3D space provides you an easy calculation to measure the said distance. <laughs> Similarly, since K has a specific relation with momentum and energy, to solve energy related issues, use of K space is far more convenient than real space. As we have defined position in real space in terms of lattice vectors A1, A2 and A3, in K space 2, we have three lattice vectors B1, B2 and B3 defined as B1 equal to 2 pi A2 cross A3 divided by the volume, B2 equal to 2 pi A3 cross A1 divided by the volume and B3 equal to 2 pi A1 cross A2 divided by the volume. Applying these we can calculate the structure of the reciprocal lattice. Okay, now you may remember that we had started this discussion with the equation psi k of r equals to e to the power i k dot r into u k of r plus r n. This is the block function. Since e to the power i k dot r is an equation of a plane wave, these calculations that we are going to perform are called plane wave DFT calculations or simply PW DFT calculations. Now, this is just a class of DFT calculations and of course the most popular class of DFT calculations. Now, why is the use of Bilua zone is so important in plane wave DFT calculation? The simple answer to this question is, in a practical DFT calculation, a great deal of the workload reduces by evaluating the integrals of the form g equals to v cell divided by 2 pi whole cube integrated over Brillouin zone g of k dk, where this v shell by 2 pi whole cube is the volume of the Brillouin zone. Now let's neglect the scribbling mathematics behind this integral. And for concept, just know that the key features of this integral are that it is defined in the reciprocal space and that it integrates only over the possible values of k in the Brillouin zone. Uh, you know, uh, you surely have performed that uh, square lattice in your graduation, maybe. Uh, and all values of k are not allowed in a Brillouin zone, okay? So, this integration is done only over the possible values of k, okay? Uh, this is a very important point, which you need to remember uh, throughout this lecture. And of course, uh, throughout your whole life, as you are not going out from DFT, as far as I guess. Now, before we try and evaluate integrals like this, First, we are going to focus at the simpler task of evaluating the integral minus 1 to 1 f of x dx numerically. Uh, see, this part has no direct connection with density functional theory. But if we do this, you will be able to understand the later part better. Okay? Okay. See, we need to evaluate this integral. 
okay now in trapezoidal method what we actually do is basically the splitting of the integrable area in some number of intervals now let's not bother about the mathematical form of this method here for now just know that two basic features of this method are the uniform spacing between the points where you evaluate function of x and second every evaluation of f of x is given equal weightage okay now there is another class of integration method called gaussian quadrature where these two conditions are neither necessary nor even desirable now for integrals on the domain minus 1 to plus 1 this approach is called legendre quadrature method uh, just to give you an idea of non uniformity in this method for n equals to 3 and the end points being minus 1 to plus 1 x1 equals to minus root under 3 by 5 which is actually equals to minus 0 0.77459 x2 equal to 0 and x3 equal to plus root under 3 by 5 which is equals to plus 0 0.77459 therefore as we are doing the integration from minus 1 to plus 1 clearly the spacing is unequal and also the weightages at each point are not the same for example, weightages at points x1 and x3 are 0 0.55555 and at x2 the weightage is 0 0.8888. Okay? Well, enough of this. It's time to look into a practical example. Let our function of x be pi x by 2 sin pi of x. So the exact value of the integration is 1. You know that. Now let's see how the number of intervals and different approaches affect our calculation. In this list, we have shown how with different number of intervals n, the estimated result vary when trapezoidal method and the Legendre quadrature method are used. As is expected too, we can see that increasing the number of intervals or in other words, using a smaller step size leads to more accurate results. From the list, it is seen that for trapezoidal method, at best, we have reached a state with error less than 1% for n equals to 5. But for Legendre quadrature method, n equal to 3 is enough for reaching the same level of accuracy. So what do we have learnt from this? How these are going to help us in understanding the DFT calculations? Okay, the extract that we are taking from here are well-behaved numerical methods will give more accurate results as the number of intervals or number of discrete points made larger. And second, different choices for the placement and weighting of the functional evaluations can give dramatic differences at which the numerical methods converge to the exact integral. Keep this in mind. Okay, now let's go back to our original domain, the domain of Brillouin zone and K points. Remember, just as we have discussed, the integration that we have performed was in Cartesian space and hence the discrete points chosen were to Cartesian. So, when we perform any integration over reciprocal space, which points are to be chosen? Maybe you have guessed it right. These are k points. Okay. That kx, ky and kz. In the previous integration, the problem was one dimensional and that's why we had to choose discrete points only along x axis. But for the 3D reciprocal space, the points will be along kx, ky and kz. I hope you got it. Good. The integral of our interest was g equals to v shell by 2 pi whole cube integrated over below h1 g of k tk. Now since this kind of integral take up so much computational effort, no wonder that the efficient evaluation of this integral itself has become a matter of particular interest for scientists. However, the solution that is most widely used today was developed by Moncrost and Pack. Actually, I couldn't find a picture for uh, Dr. James D. Pack. So if any one of you can find the picture, please send it to me. I actually love doing DFT and I am actually a kind of fond of all the people who did and are doing DFT calculations. However, most DFT packages offer the option of choosing k points based on this method. To use this method, all that is needed is to specify how many k points are to be used in each direction of reciprocal space. 
if m number of k points are used in each direction it is usual to label the calculations as having m cross m cross m k points now after the discussion of numerical integration in the previous section one thing is clear that using m cross m cross m k points should give more accurate results than a calculation with n cross n cross n k points if m is greater than n but at the same time what you have to keep in mind is the use of a large m is also time consuming okay then the question becomes in practice how many k points should we choose okay here we are going to present a table of results from computing the total energy of fcc copper with m cross m cross m k points generated using monkost pack method in this table we have listed m that is number of k points in each direction calculated energy per atom in units of electron volt number of k points in irreducible bellois zone okay let me give you a short note here about what actually is this irreducible bellois zone or ibz see many symmetries exist in a perfect structure of a solid due to the symmetries the integral need not be evaluated using the entire bellois zone instead evaluation in just a reduced portion of bellois zone is enough now such minimum volume of bellois zone which cannot be reduced further is called irreducible bellois zone or ibz now just to give you an idea of how useful is the use of this ibz in our calculations is for a 10 cross 10 cross 10 sampling of bellois zone you actually need to perform a 1000 k points based calculation but using ibz you only need to take 35 k points which is actually amazing isn't it thank you okay let's go back to our list the next thing that is listed is normalized time that is time required for calculation with m cross m cross m k points compared to the time required for 1 cross 1 cross 1 k points And that is the unit of time here uh, is the time required for 1 cross 1 cross 1 k points in that unit we are measuring everything so these times are just the multiples of uh, of the time required for 1 cross 1 cross 1 k point let's consider only these two points here in this plot you can see the result graphically look carefully the total energy it seem to be almost independent of the number of k points which gives a clear indication that number of k points greater than 8 is sufficient to provide a oil conversion calculation another curious feature of this table is if m is an odd number time taken for calculation is often same and sometimes greater too as compared to the time taken for m plus 1 number of k points this happens because of the lost symmetry due to the use of odd number of k points and as you can see from the list that the number of k points in irreducible bellois zone is same for m and m plus 1 k points where m is an odd number so usually choosing an even number for m is more convenient than choosing an odd number okay i hope uh, up to this point you have got everything well let's see what if the symmetry is lost even by a very little amount let's do the same calculations like the one we have seen before with the same fcc supercell but let's change the nearest neighbor spacing between the atoms by plus minus 0.09 angstrom and thus we are actually removing the symmetries okay uh, now though this perturbation is very small it's important to note that if we are looking at overall scenario the symmetries are lost by a quite large amount okay so before going to the list showing the results for the calculations let me make one thing clear to you well it is true that the time you are going to need for a certain calculation depends on the number of k points in ibz but doing the calculation in less time is not your first priority okay your first priority is the convergence and convergence of calculation depends on the density of k points in full bellois zone that is your convergence depends upon the number m and the time you are going to need depends upon the number of k points in ibz okay and not only the number m actually you also need to consider the volume of the bellois zone more the volume of the bellois zone more m you should take 
because finally it is the density of k points in below zone okay just after some time we are going to see an example of this uh, particular thing now let us go to the chart okay here is the list only change in this table from the previous one is we have included one more column here to show the energy difference between the symmetric and non-symmetric calculations yeah, you can clearly see here that how the number of k points in ibz and hence also the computational time is increased actually here number of k points in ibz is equals to m cube by 2 okay you can check it for yourself anyway one thing is evident that delta e appears to converge here more rapidly with the number of k points than the total energy e this is one thing really useful to us because energy difference between two configurations is more physically interesting than the absolute energies maybe you are thinking why see there is always some systematic difference between our numerically evaluated integrals for a particular atomic configuration and the true values of the same integrals okay now let's call this term systematic error or in other words we can say numerically derived value equals to real value minus the systematic error now if we are comparing two configurations which have structural similarities to a great extent then it is reasonable to expect that the systematic numerical error is also similar this means that the energy difference between these two can be expected to cancel out at least a portion of the systematic error leading to calculated energy differences more accurate than the total energies themselves uh, one thing should be clear here that it applies this argument applies only when two structures are similar enough to make a similar kind of systematic error okay so it would be far less reasonable to expect the same argument to apply if we are comparing two significantly different crystal structures for a material okay let's move to our next topic let's say you want to perform calculations for bulk copper using a super shell that has lattice vectors a1 equals to a comma 0 comma 0 a2 equals to 0 comma a comma 0 and a3 equals to 0 comma 0 comma 4a without doing much calculation can you predict at which number of k points calculation for this one are going to converge well a rule of thumb is that calculations that have similar densities of k points in the reciprocal space will have similar levels of convergences for fcc copper we have seen that 8 cross 8 cross 8 k points were giving somewhat good amount of convergence for fcc primitive shell it was 8 cross 8 cross 8 so for this structure along k1 and k2 it will be 8 but what for k3 let's calculate the reciprocal lattice vectors uh, this is just simple graduation so b1 equals to 2 pi a2 cross a3 divided by the volume equals to 2 pi by a j cap cross 4 k cap divided by 4 which is equals to actually 2 pi by a i cap b2 equal to 2 pi a3 cross a1 divided by the volume which is actually equals to 2 pi by a 4 k cap cross i cap divided by 4 equals to 2 pi by a j cap and b3 equals to 2 pi by a1 cross a2 divided by the volume equals to 2 pi by a i cap cross j cap by 4 equals to 2 pi by a into 1 by 4 k cap clearly the length of the reciprocal vector v3 is one fourth of b1 and b2 so to have similar density as per the rule of thumb along v3 uh, or along kz number of k points in this direction also should be one fourth of the number of k points along kx and ky so the correct choice for k points would be 8 cross 8 cross 2 i think there is no confusion anymore still uh, many things are left there to consider the numerical integration we talked about is an integration of a continuous function two main privileges of using continuous functions are first they are comparatively easy to integrate and second they provide rapid convergence to the exact integral but unfortunately continuity is not a property that is always available in case based integrals for dft calculations a special and important example of this fact is for metals 
Actually, metals can be defined as the material in which the Bilwa zone can be divided into regions that are occupied and unoccupied by the electrons. The surface in K space that separates these two regions is called Fermi surface. I am sure you have learned about this, that conduction band and valence band and blah blah blah. Now, as at Fermi surface, the function to be integrated changes discontinuously from non-zero value to zero abruptly, special efforts are needed to calculate these integrals. Question is, what happens if we don't adopt two new methods? Well, the answer is, it's just that, then very large number of k-points will be needed to get well-converged results. Okay, uh, actually I'm a fan of the Dark Knight series. Uh, I hope uh, many of you are too. Especially the Joker and of course the philosophy of the Batman. Uh, however, that is not a topic of DFT. Uh, let's move on. Among many different useful algorithms, we'll speak about two of them here briefly. First one is called the tetrahedron method. In this method, a discrete set of k-points are used to define a set of tetrahedra that fills the reciprocal space. Then, the function to be integrated is defined at every point in a tetrahedron using interpolation. So, interpolation is what we use here. Once interpolation is complete, the function to be integrated has a rather simple form at all positions in k-space. Now, after the interpolation is done by using a function, all you have to do is the integration of that function over the entire k-space. Another scientist, Blockhill, had developed a version of this method that includes interpolation that goes beyond linear interpolation. And this is now the most widely used one. Since detailed discussion of this is not the scope of this lecture series, I have provided the links of some important papers on this in the description below. Another important method to deal with the said problem is smearing method. Before trying to understand this, let's check the meaning of smearing at first. Smearing means damaging the reputation by false accusation. Uh, let's see how this is useful here. Here, we actually force the function to be continuous by smearing out the discontinuity. So we are trying to damage the reputation of being discontinuous here. Okay, of course we need an example. Without example, nothing is complete. Example of a smearing function is f of k minus k0 equals to exponential k minus k0 by sigma plus 1 whole to the power minus 1. If we plot this function for different values of sigma, the graphs look like this. It is the graph for sigma equals to 0 0.02 this one for sigma equal to 0 0.5 and this is for sigma equals to 0 0.1. One important feature of this graph is, as sigma goes to 0, the function approaches a step function that changes discontinuously from 1 to 0 at k equals to k0. And this is exactly what we need, an abrupt change, but using a continuous function. However, most widely used smearing method was developed by Math Fischel and Paxton. But yes, their function used for smearing is much more complicated than the one we have discussed, but still characterized by a single parameter sigma. For interested students, I have provided the link of this paper in the description box, and you know how to download free papers, right? Okay, so that was all, but wait, here is the summary. Don't get demoralized by the word summary. Here, we are going to provide you a kind of checklist to note down, which will actually help you while doing the DFT calculations. These are actually the kind of key ideas related to getting well-converged results in K-Space. Okay, first one is, before pursuing a large series of DFT calculations for a system of interest, because after doing a large series of calculation, you cannot come back and you actually don't want to come back. Okay, so before going to a large series of calculations, numerical data exploring the convergence of calculations with respect to the number of k points should be obtained. Second, number of k points used in any calculation should be reported since not doing so makes the reproduction of the result difficult. Even for you, if you are doing the same calculation after 5 years, uh, maybe you will not know how many number of k-points you have used. Okay? Okay. Third, 
increasing the volume of a super shell reduces the number of k points needed to achieve convergence because remember we have talked that the density of k points is important here that the density of k points is what that matters okay for convergence now as the volume increases in real space that corresponds to the decreasing volume in reciprocal space that's why increasing the volume of a super shell actually reduces the number of k points needed to achieve convergence okay i hope that point is clear the fourth point is if calculations involving super shells with different volumes are to be compared choosing k points show that the density of k points in reciprocal space is comparable for both the super shells is a useful way to have comparable levels of convergence in k space what should be comparable is the density of k points not the number of k points okay the fifth point is having a clarity of how symmetry is used to reduce the number of k points for which calculations are actually performed can help in understanding how long individual calculations will take but overall convergence is determined by the density of k points in the full bilwa zone okay and of course as you have seen appropriate methods must be used to accurately treat k space for metals okay okay so that is all for today our next lecture is of course going to have the title of nuts and bolts of dft 2 so please subscribe to my channel uh, see i am doing this much for you you should uh, subscribe and like and share uh, this particular lecture uh, and of course my channel uh, and i have provided a challenge for you in the shorts so please go through this and uh, so thank you uh, thank you all for listening and uh, having time with me thanks a lot